So now we are going to move west to Mauritius uh, for a story of history that I was completely unaware of until just a few days ago. We're going to learn about the Jewish deportation to Mauritius. And we have a video presentation um, from our colleagues at the Bobasin Jewish Detainees Memorial and Information Center um, and uh, Roni Michael. So we're very much looking forward to watching this presentation. Good morning, everyone. My name is Ronim Kellarielli, and I am a historian working with the Baobasin Jewish Detainees Memorial and Information Center located in San Martin Cemetery on Mauritius Island. Not many know that in December 1940, 1,580 Jewish men, women, and children who fled Nazi controlled Europe and survived the long journey to Haifa were deported by the British mandatory authorities in Palestine to the British colony of Mauritius. The detainees spent four years and seven months behind Iron Gates before leaving the island in August 1945. As the detainees left, the side and story all but passed from collective memory. Though there have been some commemoration efforts since the 90s, the Je Jewish deportation to Mauritius is largely neglected from most accounts of World War II and the Holocaust, as well as from Mauritius history and memory. Over the next hour, we invite you to join us on a, a virtual journey dedicated to this forgotten chapter. I would like to first ask Owen Griffith, the president of the uh, Island Hebrew Congregation of Mauritius, to say some opening remarks. Dear all those attending this Mauritian Global Visual, together we remember, let me say greetings. As president of the Mauritian Jewish community, it's a great honor for me to be able to introduce this program today. When I settled in Mauritius in 1984, I quickly became aware of this tragic, unjust, but in a way uplifting story of the Jewish detainees who escaped the Shoah, arrived in Palestine, only to be deported and imprisoned in Mauritius. Early on, I met a Mauritian lady, Genevieve Pito, who made it almost her life's work to document this little known and almost forgotten story. As a child at school, Genevieve had periodically a detainee as an art teacher. Her name was Anne Frank. And by the way, she's not related to the, the sadly famous uh, Anne Frank of Holland. Genevieve never understood as a child why this Jewish woman was in Mauritius and why periodically she couldn't come to school and teach because we know, and she subsequently knew, that this teacher was periodically locked up, as were the detainees by the British, in more difficult times uh, during the war. Years later, Genevieve saw an art exhibit in Germany featuring works by this very same art teacher. And that really surprised her and triggered her desire to find out more. This led ultimately to her publishing the Mauritian Shekel, documenting for the first time this incredible story. I was also, over the years, very honoured to meet many ex-detainees, especially Aaron Zwergborn, who was the president of, or the leader of all the detainees in prison, and his son, Tali Regev. And I might say, Tali and his family and I remain very good friends to this day. Before handing back to Ronnie, I want to take this opportunity to thank all those who helped in the maintenance of the detainee cemetery, helping with the Associated Museum, and keeping the memory of the detainees alive. And for this, I would like to list, and it's not an exhaustive list, Medin Sugar Estate, Black River Council, the Mauritius Israel Friendship Society, or AMI, the African Jewish Congress in South Africa, the Island Hebrew Congregation in Mauritius, and most especially, Rabbi Moshe Silberhaft, Tali Regev, Tali Nate, and of course, you, Ronnie, yourself. And with that, I'll leave it all to Ronnie. Thank you very much. Thank you, Owen. Located off the eastern coast of Africa, Mauritius Island in the Indian Ocean has a rich colonial history. It was possessed by the Dutch in 1598 and was abandoned in the early 18th century to become the capital of French power. British imperial control on the island was established after a British invasion in 1810 and ended on 12 March 1969, when Mauritius became independent. 
During World War II, the multi-ethnic society of Mauritius included about 400,000 people, two-thirds of Indo-Pakistani origin, most of whom are descendants of uh, indentured workers brought to work in the sugar industry during the 19th and early 20th centuries. One fourth of Creole of mixed French and African descent and a small uh, number of people of Chinese and Franco-Mauritian descent. The Crown Colony played a central role in British strategic planning and during World War II, local troops were recruited for service overseas. The Eastern Fleet guarded the Indian Ocean and Mauritius became a base for a British naval and was considered the star and key of the Indian Ocean. However, the story of the Jewish deportation to Mauritius begins in Europe. In November 1940, when three ships, Pacific, Milos, and Atlantic, arrived in Palestine, carrying 3,500 illegal Jewish immigrants escaping Nazi control Europe. These ships were chartered on 4 September 1940 by the Central Office for Jewish Immigration under the head of the Austrian Jewish financial advisor Bertolt Stoffer and with the consent and cooperation of the German authorities. The refugees came from Jewish communities in Vienna, Prague, Brno, Berlin, Munich, and Danzig to endure a long journey on crowded ships from Bratislava, which was at the time a client state of Nazi Germany, British Mandatory Palestine. It was a diverse group of people and therefore included people from all streams of Judaism. Moreover, not all the passengers were Zionists. While the group from Czechoslovakia included mainly young men and women, uh, members of uh, the Chalutz movement, who went through uh, a training program and agric agriculture centers where they learned te technical uh, skills necessary for their immigration to Israel and subsequent life in kibbutzim. The Danzig group, on the other hand, included families, men, women, and children who were listed by the community board and in one uh, August morning in 1940 were led by the Gestapo to the central uh, train station and were sent to Bratislava. Most of them did not know their destination. During that period, the Zionist leadership stand on illegal immigration to Palestine was ambivalent. While Jews were ready to embark on illegal transport and to risk their lives on illegal voyages, Zionist bodies such as the labor Zionist Musad Le'Aliyah Bet and the revisionist Merkaz Le'Aliyah did not wish to appear as supporters of illegal actions or so-called collaboration with the Nazis. Such, such a stand may explain why when the refugees finally reached into the Haifa harbor, they were met with a cold reception from the Jewish administrative. Arya Leopold Keller, who arrived in Palestine with his parents from Danzig when he was 13 years old, wrote in his diary. On November 24 at dawn, we saw the mountains of Zula and then Mount Carmel, and all of us streamed to the, to the deck and sang Hatikva with great emotion. The Jews we came into contact with, especially the officials, looked at the illegal immigrant ship with indifference and cynicism. It seemed as if their paperwork was more important to them than the fate of the people. More than the behavior of the British, which after all we could understand, the attitude of the issue depressed us and we felt helpless. Due to the 1939 British White Paper, which enforced a strict immigration quota for Jews entering Palestine, some of the arriving immigrants were transferred to a ship called Patria to be deported to Mauritius. In response, the underground military organization of the Yishuv in Palestine, the Haganah, decided to sabotage the ship, a decision that caused the tragic death of 260 Jewish refugees. The British authorities permitted the survivors of the Patria to stay in Palestine, transferring them to their Clint camp near Haifa. However, on 5 December, 1,580 of the Atlantic passengers were forcibly removed from Atlit to two Dutch ships to be sent to Mauritius. 
It was the first case in which Jewish refugees who had reached the coastline of Palestine were forcibly removed to a distant lo location outside of Palestine. A few weeks before the arrival of the refugees to the Haifa Harbor, on 13 November 1940, a telegram sent by the British colonial office to the governor of Mauritius stated, the problem of illegal immigration into Palestine, which has caused a, a good deal of trouble in the past, has once more became acute. All these immigrants now come from enemy or enemy occupied countries. We have no check whatever over them. Written a week before the Patriot tragic episode occurred, and when the Atlantic passengers were already on their way to Palestine, this confidential telegram describes the British initial plan for the 1,740 Patriot passengers to be shipped at the, the earliest possible moment to Mauritius where provisions can be made for their detention during the period of the war. It provides a window into the British Mandate Authority's perception of the Jewish ref refugees not merely as illegal immigrants, but as a possible threat because of their places of origins, Nazi-occupied areas. Another indication uh, for such distortion on the part of the British officials is that of the violent deportation of the Atlantic passengers from the athlete camp. Joseph Adler, a refugee from Czechoslovakia, was 20 years old when he was deported to Mauritius with his wife and baby. He vividly described these events. The police officers took us man one by one and forcibly led them to the cars. Those who tried to resist were violently thrown into trucks. Most of the young men were actually naked. We went out in a convoy of trucks to the port of Haifa and they divided us to two ships. Not only did the refugees test, uh, testify that uh, upon uh, entering the ships, they were stripped out of most of their belongings. Among other things, the British officers on board took the refugees' glasses and in one ship, the man's hair was cropped close, not for hygienic reasons, but in order to annoy and hum humiliate the refugees. During their 17 days voyage to Mauritius, the refugees, most of whom have never heard of Mauritius, received misinformation from those around them. As expressed uh, in uh, Joseph Adler's recollection, some of the experts among the refugees stressed Telling, started telling stories on the island that were far from reality. They told us that lions and monkeys were wandering around freely. The ships finally entered Port Louis at night, and on the next day, we saw the city and the, and the island and were pleasantly surprised to see a train of buses and cars when we imagined the jungle. While the detainees imagined an exotic jungle with wild animals on uh, this far off land, they were uh, surprised to find signs of progress and modernity. They also found, for the first time in their long voyage, some friendly, friendly spaces for waiting for them. Arons Bergwam, a young lawyer with Zionist leanings, originally from Prague, who served as a leader among the detainees in Mauritius, described the arrival of the refugees to the island. He wrote that when the refugees were driven to their des destination camp in buses, the Mauritians lined the road greeting and cheering them and testified that the deportees were touched and agreeably surprised by this unexpected welcome, even if it could not change their, their fates. Although the warm uh, reception received by the local population, there was no paradise waiting for the refugees in their new location. At the end of a long journey on overcrowded ships, buses and trucks transferred the refugees to the central prison of Baobasin, where most of them spent the next four years and seven months behind iron gates. The high walls of the uh, principal compound ensured the separation between two sections of the camp. The men were accommodated in the prison cells and the women and children were brought to a compound of a specially built huts. The major concern during the early weeks of detention were the number of sick and dead detainees, and an average of 10% of the people were kept 
in the camp hospital. Nevertheless, the refugees developed a vibrant social and cultural and economic life behind Iron Gates and had different kinds of encounters with the local population. They had workshops on the camp in which the detainees produced wooden and fabric toys, silver jewelries, and other items to sell outside the camp. They had a bakery, a synagogue, schools and libraries, youth movements, a football team, and a very successful camp band. I would like to invite Tali Regev now, the honorary consul of Mauritius in Israel, and one of the 60 babies to be born on the island during the deportation to give us a glimpse into his family story. Good, uh, good morning to, to all of you. I'm uh, really honored uh, to be interviewed to uh, this important uh, video. My name is uh, Tali Regev, uh, Ned Zwergbaum, and uh, I'm uh, the Honorary Consul of uh, Mauritius in Israel. My parents, uh, Regina and uh, Dr. Aaron Zwergbaum, were deported uh, to, uh, uh, to Mauritius uh, by the British, uh, along uh, with uh, 15 and 80 other Mapilim, uh, illegal immigrants, who were on their way to the shores of Israel from Europe. Uh, they had met each other not long before the deportation on the us on the way to Bratislava. Uh, my father was active in uh, in Czechoslovakia. He is, he was from Breno. He was active in the student uh, Jewish uh, student movement in Blauweiss and. Uh, actually prepared himself to immigrate to, to, to Palestine in those days. My mother uh, was born in Poland but uh, spent her life in uh, Danzig and she uh, uh, went with other about 500 members of the Jewish community of Danzig to Brat Bratislava uh, to, to move to Palestine. It was before the Van Ze conference and um, Nazis' uh, final solution was in those times to, the, to uh, send uh, the Jews out from uh, Europe. Uh, <clears throat> they spent about a year in Bratislava uh, before they went on the Atlantic, started the journey on the Atlantic uh, to Palestine. The, the journey was uh, quite a saga, which uh, I won't elaborate here, but it uh, took them quite a long time. And on the end, and in the end, they were caught by the British uh, near Cyprus and they were they put to athlete prison or concentration camp in athlete. Uh, they uh, were uh, deported to, to Mauritius, as I said before, in uh, December nine, 1940. Were separated. My father was put in the main prison of Mauritius in Bobassin and my mother with other with the other uh, women and children in the camp adjacent to the hospital uh, to the prison they got married in uh, 1942 uh, after the british realized that uh, those uh, poor refugees are not a real threat to the british empire and gave them much more uh, freedom. So they could, could, met, could meet and uh, uh, family relationships started. Uh, my, my father got uh, the um, Hargreaves, uh, the um, 
commander of the prison uh, suit in order that he would be uh, addressed uh, properly to his, uh, for his marriage. I was born in uh, 5th of July, 1944, and I'm among 60 children who were born in uh, Mauritius. My, the uh, Czech group was uh, relatively young, as I mentioned before, they were uh, planning to, to immigrate to Israel, they, uh, to Palestine in those days. They um, uh, were trained and they were very, um, they were uh, a very strong uh, group. My father was one of the, um, let's say, leaders of the group. He was the liaison between uh, the camp and the Zionist uh, Federation in Jerusalem and in uh, with uh, South Africa and wrote uh, uh, almost a daily diary that was published uh, yearly and was circulated. He was typing it on his uh, typing machine and was um, circulated later on between, uh, between the refugees. Uh, he uh, he uh, also was in charge of the membership to the Fader, uh, Zionist Federation, the Shekel, who the, the, the refugees or the detainees uh, bought in order to be a member of, of the movement. Uh, when he, when um, my parents came back to Israel on, uh, on uh, August uh, 1945, he was um, immediately so-called uh, taken by the Zionist Federation in Jerusalem and start working there. My mother and myself were about a year in the kibbutz in, in um, Gaton and moved to Jerusalem later on. Since then, my father had a very strong contact with the Mor with Mauritius, and it's the reason that I was actually connected to, to Mauritius uh, since my childhood. Uh, every time that uh, somebody came from Mauritius, and my father was invited to the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, I went uh, with him. Uh, Every Mauritian who came to Israel uh, through uh, Mashhab or the Minister of Foreign Affairs, I think like that, or Histadrut came to visit us and we had a strong uh, relationship with them. In addition, my father had strong uh, relations uh, and uh, uh, correspondence with his friends, uh, from Mauritius during his uh, uh, stay in the camp. It could be uh, Lava Pierre and other names that unfortunately are not uh, alive anymore. I, I was appointed as the only consul of Mauritius in, in Israel in, in 1965, and since then I'm uh, representing the interests of Mauritius here in Israel. Thank you very much. On February 21st, 1945, the governor of Mauritius informed the detainee's leadership that the British authorities had decided to allow the Jewish refugees held in Mauritius to enter Palestine. However, it took another six months before the refugees actually left the, the island. It is important to note that the South African Jewish community located 3,000 500 kilometers from the island, invested much of its war efforts in assisting the Jewish refugees across the Indian Ocean. The community sent kosher food, materials for the workshops, books, a newspaper, and do donated money for the camp. Moreover, the South African Jewish Board of Deputies, together with the Council of German Jewry in London, 
formed a committee in Johannesburg to render relief to refugees who arrived in Southern Africa, and the Council for Refugee Settlement was established. This council later also included uh, the, uh, the activities related to the British uh, uh, camp in Mauritius. In 1946, the South African Jewish Board of Deputies acquired ownership of the San Martin Jewish Cemetery in Mauritius, where 128 Jewish refugees who died during their detention were buried. I would like to invite Vanessa Kahlo, our amazing guide and the beating heart of the Baubasin Jewish Detainees Memorial and Information Center, to share with us two stories of uh, detainees who perished in Mauritius during the uh, detention period and are now buried at the San Martin Jewish Cemetery in Mauritius. Vanessa, a guide as a Jewish Detainees Memorial Center. I must admit to my viewers that I was among those many Mauritians who was aware of this little known part of my country's history. But during my work, I got the opportunities to meet visitors, including ex-detainees, family members of ex-detainees, and also researchers. Some of them will remain silent because this is an episode maybe of their family history or of their own experiences where there are too much atrocities behind. And I've learned to respect this silence. Others will share stories behind the graves of their beloved one. Believe me, according to my experience, these sharings can change your perceptions on the way you looked at the graves. Numbers become names, and behind each name, there's a story. Today, I will share with you two of these stories. As we are going through this hard time right now, because of this pandemic of the coronavirus, and uh, not finding a cure yet for the disease, my heart goes out to the Isla family. Why? Because there was a young Viennese girl, 20 years old, named Edith Isla, who was detained in Mauritius with her parents. In that camp, she was affectionately known as Dita. In late February 1945, a polio epidemic broke out on the island and no vaccine existed. There were five cases in the camp. In April 45, Dita was one of them. She was suffering from respiratory paralysis and was sent to the hospital for treatment. Despite all treatment attempted to save her life, she didn't make it. This is a loss which had upset the whole plans of the detainment camp in Mauritius. Why? Because in 1945, the camp was rejoicing because they knew that the war was coming to an end and that freedom was in sight. This was my first personal story behind the graves, but more additional information will be provided by my encounter with Oscar Langzam in January 2016. Oscar was a boy of 10 years old when he was deported to Mauritius. On the day I met him, he was 85. So he came back after 70 years because he wanted to pay respect to, home, to someone who was very dear to his heart and uh, buried in the Samarta Cemetery. In fact, Dita was Oscar's music teacher. The second story is about an artist named Fritz Andale. Fritz was born on the 21st June 1910. He was a very multi-talented artist. 
he plays key role in the camp. He was a member of the of the welfare committee of the camp, and also he made marionettes. He was allowed to do an exhibition at Hotel de Ville in Kyopip in the center of the island in 1942. And he was among those minority detainees who got the chance to work outside the camp because not it was a privilege, not everybody had got this privilege. So he became a, an English teacher at the Mauritius Teachers Training School in Bobasa. On his way to the promised land, he met his future wife, Hannah, Hannah Godley. In, 19, in 1944, he wed Hannah, and uh, after sometimes his wife started feeling nauseous, and a pregnancy was announced to her by the camp doctor Lederer. On the day she was going to announce to Fritz the good news, she was confronted to a horrible scene when she opened the door of her husband's cell. Fritz has committed suicide. He never knew that he was going to be a father. He was a great artist. By the way, we still have uh, his sketches in one museum in Mauritius. So I would like to share some with you. This first sketch is um, the sketch of an old man, an old man in the cave named Elias Kochman. He is one of the 128 deceased with, who rest in peace in Samarta. He was taking altuitions and um, you know, in, in the camp, only those healthy detainees who were aged 18 to 55 were allowed to work. Those beyond 55 years old were not allowed to work. The second sketch, the second sketch depicts a woman in shock when she enters her husband's cells, finding, you know, a spider web, and um, this drawing was sketches on the occasion when the women have got their daily past to visit the husband cells because in the Mauritius camp there was no family lives. There were two separate separated camps. There were the women, the men camps, and the women's camp. It is important to note that Handel's artwork and life story were presented as part of a traveling exhibition titled Boarding Pass to Paradise, which was curated by the Israeli art exhibition curator, Elena Makarova, in 2004, and toured several European and Israeli venues between the years 2005 and 2008. The exhibition also included the art and life story of another extremely talented detainee, Peretz Bede Mayer. Bede and Fritz worked together. They produced wooden toys, wood placers, shoe shaper, shapes, and uh, suit, suitcase uh, out of local raw materials. They also engaged in art, drawings, cartoons, paintings, and uh, woodcuts, um, uh, portraits, and copies. As Vanessa mentioned, they both taught art on the island and uh, held an exhibition or their painting to the uh, open to the public. One of the most significant research on Mauritius episode was published in 1998 in a book, The Mauritian Shekel, that Owen mentioned earlier, written by Genevieve Pito, a native uh, a Mauritian who lived in Germany, but who had close relationship with Anne Frank, uh, the Jewish detainee who was her art teacher. Peter was not the only Mauritian to write about the Jewish detainees held on the island. Um, 
In her novel, The Last Brother, Mauritian French author Natasha Alpana wrote about a fictional friendship between a local Mauritian boy and a Jewish refugee from Czechoslovakia. In an interview to a local Ma uh, Mauritian magazine, Apana stated that she decided to write about the story because of the anger she felt when she was told about the historical events in France. I felt like my head was going to explode. I was ashamed of uh, not being aware of this chapter in Mauritius history, and in particular of having to learn it from a Frenchman. I, a Mauritian, had no idea that this episode had taken place in my own country. Nobody had ever told me about it, not even in history class at school. It's as if the subject were taboo. Apana's testimony uh, brings to the fore an important and critical absence, that of the local Mauritian memories of the episode. Towards this aim, in May 2019, we at the Baubasin Jewish Detainees Memorial and Information Center formed collaboration with the Johannesburg Holocaust and Genocide Center, the Rosa Luxemburg Stiffing Southern Africa, and the MOA organization in Mauritius for Human Rights on the Indian Ocean. Subsequently, the museum received many inquiries from people who remember the Jewish refugees, allowing us, through this collaboration, to start collecting personal materials from the public and conducting a subset of video testimonies. Last January, we had another successful visit to Mauritius, where uh, we actually started interviewing people who turned to uh, the Memorial and Information Center. Uh, and uh, what came up was uh, some amazing interviews with uh, people who actually had uh, some artwork that was made by some of the refugees. Our first uh, interviewee was Mary Claude. Uh, and Mary Claude was eight years old when her father uh, uh, invited the, the German refugee, Anne Frank, to come and uh, paint a portrait of her and her sister. And uh, she tells in uh, the interview uh, that she remembered that her mother, uh, when she uh, knew that the, the refugee, Anne Frank, is coming, uh, prepared uh, uh, a plate full of cookies and that uh, every time uh, when uh, Anne Frank uh, arrived and painted uh, uh, Marie Claude, she insisted that they would eat the cookies together. Um, another very, very special uh, um, uh, interview that we had was with uh, uh, Francis Briotte, uh, who holds a painting of uh, Fritz uh, Bidet Mayer. Uh, and the story is amazing. This is the story of uh, her father who uh, actually went to the exhibition held by uh, Fritz Bidet and uh, Handel at a time at uh, Rose Hill in uh, Mauritius. And he actually insisted on every uh, member of the family uh, uh, to buy uh, paintings of uh, those painters, and you can actually see the framing, the framing of uh, of uh, the painting, the wooden one, uh, which was also made uh, inside the workshop uh, in in the camp. Uh, so this is this was also a very moving uh, interview where we realized that uh, not only that. Uh, local people in Mauritius uh, were uh, uh, purchasing artwork from the refugees as uh, a gesture of empathy and in order to help them. Uh, they also cherish those uh, paintings as a treasure. Uh, and for us, of course, it is a huge uh, treasure, uh, treasure and uh, a great footstep of uh, the Jewish presence on the island. Another fascinating interview was with Harry Hargrave, the son of one of the British camp commanders. He was born on the island in 1943 
that his father was one uh, of the officers to be on the Patria when it sank and saved himself. He later escorted the, the refugees to Mauritius from Palestine and worked on the camp until it was liberated in August 1945. After the, the war, Hergrave and uh, his family went uh, back to Palestine with the refugees and stayed in Palestine until the establishment of the State of Israel. In 1948, they moved back to Mauritius, but kept close ties with some of the refugees. Harry told us that uh, when he was born, the refugees made him a spoon made out of Mauritian rupee uh, uh, in the camp workshop, a spoon he cherished till this day. By capturing the act of uh, remembrance of witnesses to history, these testimonies and personal materials add another layer to this transnational history of the Holocaust by exploring the Indian Ocean's perspective on the histories of World War II, the Holocaust, and British colonialism. I would like to conclude our session by commemorating the 128 detainees who did not survive the long imprisonment and were doomed to eternal rest at the San Martin Jewish Cemetery in Mauritius, while the cemetery is cl uh, currently closed to the public due to the shutdown. Our friend Mr. Young made sure that we will be able to invite you to join us in a virtual journey in memory of the Mauritius deportation victims. <laughs>